Um, well, welcome to everyone that's here, which is just a handful of people. Um, I, all right, I'm just getting my screen organized. Let's get this over here. Great. Okay. So welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Jen Schachter. I am actually from New York, so it's an honor to be here. I grew up on Long Island for the first 18 years of my life. Um, about me, I am an artist and a maker. Uh, I'm currently the director of special projects at Savage Industries and a contributor for Tested.com. Um, I have written for Make Magazine and been on TV on Savage Builds, but most of you probably know me from the big collaborative build projects I've led over the past several years. And that's what we're here to talk about. So let's dive right in. Oh, that's my little intro. Um, so first off, what is a collaborative build? Uh, my definition, it's basically any creative project made by a team of people who bring different skill sets to the table. That could be a theater production, a mural, a maker fair exhibit. Uh, it doesn't have to be large or public, but they sometimes are. And they're often site specific or associated with an event. So some of you may have watched uh, build videos linked in the talk or seen some of the projects on social media. But for those of you who are not familiar with them, um, I'll do a quick one run through of some of the examples of these builds. So uh, the first community build project that uh, I got to be part of was a set of giant let light up letters uh, that I made for a festival at the White House in 2016. Uh, it was called South by South Lawn, uh, as in the South Lawn of the White House, and it was inspired by South by Southwest. Um, I basically got connected with the project uh, by my former boss, uh, who called me one day and said, do you want to work on a project with Adam Savage for the White House? It's in three weeks. Uh, so this this image was the actual mock-up that I got that I got from uh, from the event team uh, that they wanted, what they wanted me to build. So I went to work right away and fabricated uh, all the parts of these giant letters here. And these are some of the initial sketches. Um, let's see if I can get this to actually fit the window of the presentation. There we go. Um, so each one was structured like a giant cabinet with uh, plywood sides and back and an acrylic front. And building the parts took basically every hour of every day leading up to the festival. On the day before the event, we tracked all the pieces to uh, Digital Harbor Foundation, which is a youth maker space in Baltimore. And um, we spent the entire day, 50 students and all the staff, um, assembling and painting and wiring up these letters. Uh, the next morning, we loaded them into a truck and drove them to Washington, D.C. And when the sun went down at the festival, uh, the lights inside the letters turned on and people could interact by tweeting at them. And a Raspberry Pi would scrape the Twitter API and change the color of the lights in real time. So this is the full effect at night. Um, another project, there's... There's SXSL. Uh, another project that I got to work on um, is with a group called We the Builders, which is a collective of makers uh, who build crowdsourced 3D printed sculptures. The concept is basically that they take an existing sculpture and they 3D scan it, and then they slice it into a three dimensional grid. Um, they were founded in uh, 20, 2014 at a hackathon uh, by Todd Blatt and Marty McGuire. Uh, that's, that's these two folks here. Um, and each part of the uh, digital thing that we've, we've created is distributed on a platform, which Marty designed, which tracks the part status and gives the host a way to communicate with all the builders. And these are some of their past projects. In 2018, we were commissioned to do a project for the inaugural Nation of Makers convening. Um, the theme of the conference was intentional inclusion. So to celebrate the diversity of women in making, we decided to make a giant monument to Rosie the Riveter. So I started off by making a seven inch tall clay sculpture, which we had 3D scanned. This is the scanning process. Um, and then Todd uh, took the 3D model and scaled it way up uh, in a digital software and then sliced the file up into 2,600 individual pieces. So this is a mock-up of what we plan on it looking like. So the inside of the model gets hollowed out um, and fitted with an internal armature for support. Um, and then we publish all the STL part files, which can be claimed online through the We The Builders platform. So people can download them all over the world to print them. In total, over 700 contributors uh, participated in this project. So they ship them all to all the parts to us in Santa Fe. 
uh, where we assembled the sculpture with the help of the conference participants. And there's there's Dan there. Um, let's see if I recognize anyone else. That's Jeanette. Uh, yeah, so lots of folks came to help us assemble it. And over the course of two days, we assembled the entire sculpture. So here's some pictures from the build. So the finished sculpture stands about six feet tall on top of her platform, and she currently resides in the New Mexico History Museum. So this next project is uh, called Project Egress, and this is a uh, project that we did with the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the moon landing, uh, which was last year in July. And uh, basically, I was, I was tasked with uh, leading a team um, to build a replica of the Apollo 11 command module hatch. So the Smithsonian had 3D scanned the hatch and uh, it's basically this like trapezoidal door that allowed the astronauts to get uh, in and out of the spacecraft. And if you're familiar with uh, NASA history at all, this is a pretty significant piece of engineering. Um, this, is, this is the actual hatch. Uh, it has been called the most complicated door in the history of humankind. Um, and we wanted to focus on that accomplishment and the invisible hand of all the men and women who, who built this machine that took us to the moon. So we enlisted the help of an, an engineer, aerospace engineer um, named Andrew Barth. And he used the hatch scans and drawings from the Smithsonian archives to reverse engineer each individual piece of the machinery. So every latch, every lever, every linkage, and you can see some of Andrew's amazing models here. So then we, we separated out each of those pieces, each mechanical piece of the structure, and we exported all the blueprints to CAD files. I then curated a group of 45 makers to replicate one part. So each maker had one piece that they had to create um, using these hatch files. So the only criteria was to make the part to exact scale but the maker could work in any medium and any process they chose. So we had ceramic sculptors, woodworkers, machinists, prop makers, um, students, and everyone worked on, uh, worked on a different piece. And then all the makers shipped their parts to the Air and Space Museum. And during the anniversary celebrations um, on a stage surrounded by 200 people, we unboxed everything and uh, assembled the entire hatch in about six hours. So this is us during the build. As you can imagine, a lot of things went wrong while we were working on it, uh, but we'll talk more about that later. Um, a handful of our extended tested family also helped us out. So this is uh, Sophie Wong and it's Stephanie, Kate Sabaker, Mel Ho. These are the MVPs of the build right here. And this piece now sits on display at the Udvar Hazy Center uh, with the Space Shuttle Discovery and various other pieces of aerospace history. So here are some, here's a couple more pictures of the hatch. Um, so that's the, that's the bird's eye view of some past projects, but I wanted to go behind the scenes a bit and share some more detail with you about some of the challenges we face and things we learned along the way, because if, uh, if you have any sense, these builds don't, don't always go smoothly. Um, I also, let's see, I don't know if I can link to a worksheet, but we can send that to you later. I put together a worksheet on building your own community build project if you're interested. In any case, um, so tips from the trenches. Uh, here's an actual behind the scenes photo of a live build. I, I'm kidding, obviously, this is, a, this is a very crowded kitchen, but that's about what it feels like when you're in the middle of one of these builds. It's dirty, it's hot, it's fast paced, everyone's bumping into each other. Uh, but you have to go into it knowing that it's going to be crazy and stressful and so many things will go wrong. Um, you won't sleep a lot. You have to kind of love that madness. You have to be willing to lean into it. Um, I know for me, I kind of, I kind of thrive on that rush. Um, so it's, it's, there's ways to get involved though that are less consuming if you don't want to be right in the eye of the hurricane. So moving on to the tips. Uh, tip number one, uh, improvise, 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 and when all else fails, let it go. So as much planning and organizing as you do, you will inevitably be building the plane as you're flying it. Um, challenges come up during the event and leading up to it, and you have to be resourceful, you have to think on your feet. Um, and the better you've anticipated the possible scenarios, the better, better prepared you'll be for them. 
So during the Rosie build, one thing we did not anticipate, and looking back, it now seems really obvious, is how long the glue would take to dry. Uh, so we basically set up each layer of the sculpture on top of its blueprint, and then we glued all the faces together. And then as each layer was, was dry, we would stack them. But as we started to lift up each layer, the parts started falling off all over the place. Um, and you can see, if you look closely, that Rosie's arm is actually held together with packing tape uh, in some places. Her elbow is supported by two by fours. And that's sort of the only thing holding your arm up. So clearly this is not ideal, but at a certain point you have to accept that you're gonna do the best with what you have in the situation and just have to move on. Then during uh, Project Egress, uh, because everything came in so close to the wire, all the parts were showing up right at the last minute, we didn't have a chance to dry fit everything and test fit it beforehand to check all the tolerances. And when we were actually on stage with 200 people watching is when we had to, to solve for this. Um, even though the parts were made to spec, uh, there's differences in the materials and the tolerances and all those things. So you're up there and you're sort of panicking in your head because things are not fitting, but we had Adam to work with who is obviously a master problem solver. So we sort of hacked and grinded and shoved everything into place. Um, but you also have to take a step back and realize that watching you solve problems in real time with real stakes is part of what makes this exciting for people. Um, it's, you know, no good story is without conflict. And every time we got past a little hurdle, every time we like made something fit that didn't seem like it would fit, we got huge applause from the audience, which was very reassuring. Um, so for uh, SXSL, uh, this might have been the most hectic of the build. So after we spent 13 hours building these letters, um, the day before the event, we met up at 5 a.m. to drive the truck to DC and you have all your equipment and stuff checked out by Secret Service um, before you can go to the White House. And we sat in this parking lot for probably three hours waiting for our inspection. And people are calling me like, where are you guys? Like, why aren't you here yet? Um, I'm like, the guys with the guns won't let us through. So we ended up getting in like 15 minutes with 15 minutes to spare before the event opened. Um, and they escort you by motorcade to the to the location. And as soon as we parked at the U-Haul with the letters inside, someone's like, you have seven minutes, go, go, go. So just to give you a sense of the level of crazy of some of these builds. Moving on to tip number two. So this is huge for community build projects because obviously you wanna take care of your team. Um, and often for, for various reasons, usually because um, you know projects like this are on a tight budget, a lot of the effort is a volunteer effort. You're not always paying every one of the participants. Um, oh, and, and the tip is to make participation worthwhile. So one of the most exciting things for me about these kind of projects is how many different creative skills people are bringing to the table. Um, you really wanna honor that and give folks as much of a stake and a role in authorship as possible. So we try to keep the guidelines um, specific where needed, but open to creative interpretation. So the guideline for Rosie was print part in skin tones. Um, the guidelines for egress were make this part to scale in any medium using any process you like. Um, I also try to make the call to action really enticing. Um, this is the pitch. This is how you get people excited about making, making the thing. So you, you pull out all the stops. Um, this is the mission document that I designed for Project Egress. Um, I've been researching tons of NASA documents from the 60s, so I tried to replicate the sort of antiquated feel and the sort of photocopied look. Um, for some of these collaborators, we were just cold calling and emailing them, um, and I wanted to give them generate some excitement. Um, and people said when they got this in their email, it felt like that they were invited to a secret club. Either that or they thought it was a total scam. Um, the absolute, excuse me, um, <clears throat> The absolute most important thing about working with collaborators is to give people credit for their contributions. Uh, you really want people to feel compensated for their time and their energy and their resources. Um, everyone who is a part of the project should be acknowledged in some way. So with Egress, we put everyone's name on a plaque uh, up front and center and attach it to the hatch so that those names will go down in history. And the object is part of the Smithsonian collection. So all these people's names will be in the museum with this thing that we all created. Um, <clears throat> we also, uh, there were some folks that came out to the build that day. So we had them actually sign their name on the hatch itself. And you can see there's some, some autographs there. Um, 
basically, I mean, you want to celebrate those contributions any way that you can. Uh, the draw for people to these projects is they want to feel like they're they're part of something. So you want to amplify and lift each other up. Um, these are some of the folks that came out to egress. Uh, but yeah, you should tag them on social, write a blog post, make commemorative t-shirts for the project or patches. Um, and all the product documentation should list all of the collaborators with links to their websites and their social media. So with egress, um, we got to do this really cool tribute where the Smithsonian went back and scanned our actual replica. So the hatch that we made, they scanned it. Um, and we collected the artists process photos and uh, their bios and we put together this interactive page so that you could go to to the hatch to the hatch that we built and actually orbit around it and click on each part and then learn about the person who made it and see images of their process. Tip number three, uh, be an expert communicator. So when communicating with your collaborators, uh, clear, concise, timely communication is everything. Um, strangely, a job that prepared me the most for this type of work was working in a kitchen uh, as a, uh, an expediter, which is basically the person, it's sort of like the quarterback of the kitchen. You, um, you read all the incoming tickets, you uh, tell the cooks what to cook, but you have to know sort of what's on deck, you have to know how long each dish takes to cook, how many reservations are about to sit down, and you're essentially setting the pace for the entire restaurant. This is what that, uh, what that ticket board looks like. Um, so a lot of that relies on your organizational skills, but you also have to communicate really effectively with the line. Um, so when you talk to the cooks in the kitchen, you would call out an order and the cook says back, heard, uh, and that lets you know that the, the message was received, they heard you. Um, there's a really great article about this um, in the New York Times about the role of the kitchen expediter that I, that I just love. Um, but anyway, you have to think about yourself as the expo. So you wanna set clear project milestones ahead of time, um, even before you send out your call to action and make sure each group understands what their deadlines are to make all the pieces fit and also that they feel supported through the entire process. Um, I keep lots of spreadsheets with to-do lists and timelines and tabs for parts management. And during the project, this is sort of where my entire brain lives. So um, like a Google sheet or a Google doc, and that way everyone can, can see the edits and see the updates in real time. So anybody who's working on it can go in and see what's happening. Uh, the irony of, of this is that during the build itself, when it's go time, if you've done your job, you can almost communicate without words. Um, you're thinking, where did I put that hammer? And your colleague is handing it to you across the table before you even go to reach for it. There's this deep, almost telepathic communication with your collaborators. It's really cool. And you're sort of, you're in the zone and you're working with your teammates and everyone, everyone knows what needs to happen next. All right, tip number four, uh, be resourceful in scouting, funding and materials. So one of the biggest questions that always comes up about community builds is where do you get funding? Um, I will be the first to admit I have been extremely lucky in getting connected with Tested uh, because obviously we have a bit of star power to draw from and I've got to do builds for fairly large events with actual you know, budgets that they can, they can give us for the project, but you don't have to be working with Adam Savage or Tested um, to, to get uh, funding to do a community build. Uh, if you can find an event that's taking place that you can pitch your project to, um, they usually have a budget for interactive uh, stuff. So the, um, the way that that usually works is like, I will look for an event and if they uh, you know, wanna do some type of community outreach, they wanna get people engaged during the event, a build like this is a huge selling point for them. Um, it, it lets people get involved beforehand, during and after the event. So it's like a great, it's a great return for them. Um, plus you already have an audience built in because there's people going to the event. So you don't have to worry about playing to an empty crowd. Um, <clears throat> so you can also sometimes look for local sponsors. Uh, there are companies sometimes that'll either give you, they'll either give you a small cash donation or they'll even donate tools and materials because it's basically free advertising for them um, to have their name associated with a public art project. Uh, you can also raise funds in more traditional ways by hosting fundraisers or writing grants um, or even crowdfunding platforms like GoFundMe and such. Um, but I will tell you that's a lot, it's a lot harder. Um, another thing to consider uh, when you're creating your project budget is to find ways to cut costs on tools and materials. Um, 
whenever possible, you want to try to use upcycled materials or found objects instead of buying new stuff, like buying new everything. Uh, so you can ask people to donate old fabric or cardboard or plastic. And that also means your environmental impact is less. Uh, oh, right. And OK, so there are a ton of free resources out there to use uh, for graphics and music and even image content that you can you can build from. Um, and one super amazing resource I wanted to point out is uh, the Smithsonian Open Access Program. Uh, it's basically a huge repository of media from the Smithsonian Archives, um, and you can you can download it all and use it for free. Um, tip number five, and I'm, I'm running low on time, so I'm going to try to uh, Oh no, not yet. It's only 11.30, okay. Um, yeah, tip number five. Uh, picks or didn't happen. Okay, so as you can tell, I have pretty exhaustive documentation of these build projects. Um, the thing is I've only taken a fraction of these pictures myself. So when you're in the eye of the storm on build day, the last thing that you're gonna be thinking about is where's my camera, I've gotta, I've gotta document this. So you wanna have at least one dedicated person uh, to be documenting the build as it's taking place. Uh, ideally that person is there with video or even a time-lapse camera so you can capture the, the progress. Uh, and it could be a volunteer or even a dedicated events person. Uh, if you're at an event, they'll usually have some type of media person that's, that's um, documenting all the action and they'll wanna capture that, but make sure that you also have the event covered too. During uh, Project Egress, uh, my friend Stephanie, she knew that we would want photos. So without even needing to be asked, she documented everything that day with a really nice camera. And I'm so grateful for that because now I have all these great portfolio pictures. Uh, it's also helpful to set up a media drop ahead of time so that people know where to, to upload their stuff afterwards. Uh, in terms of promoting the event leading up to and afterwards, I highly recommend having an event page. Uh, so people want to share what they've been a part of. Um, you can write a blog post or a landing page on your website. Uh, we also try to create a unique hashtag for the project on social media so people can follow along in one place. With SXSL, the interactivity was actually centered around a hashtag. So not only could people change the color by tweeting at the sign, but it also drove social traffic for that event. So it's a win-win. Uh, there is a really great platform called walls.io uh, that we use for, for the Rosie project. And it basically scrapes content from all the social media platforms. So Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, um, and it, it pulls all of that content onto one page. So anything that uses that hashtag will appear on your, on your wall there. Uh, there is a basic free version and then you can also upgrade and, and have more control over how the page looks. Tip number six, uh, trust the process. So this is the last tip and probably the most valuable thing I've learned uh, doing all these builds. And I relearn this uh, in new ways every single time we do a new one. So no matter how well thought out and supported each one of these builds has been, there is a moment or even several moments um, when I'm in the thick of it, just in the weeds, and I take a step back and I think we're not gonna pull this off. There's no way we're gonna pull this off. Uh, so with egress, tons of parts were coming in right down to the wire, and I was calling shipping companies trying to track them down. And at one point we looked at the, the clock during the build and all the pieces are spread out all over the place. And we're like, what are we going to do? There's not going to be enough time. So we asked for help. Uh, with, with Rosie, it looked like not enough people were going to claim all the parts. So without, without all the pieces being printed, we basically didn't have a sculpture. Um, and then during the build, I can tell you, I can't tell you the terror when huge chunks of the of the layers started falling off and coming apart in our hands. And then, yeah, with with SXSL, uh, this one was just absolutely crazy. And to design and fabricate these giant letters and assemble them the day before they're supposed to be on the White House lawn, and then installing them in in seven minutes. Um, the point is that there is a stage in every single build where I am sure we will fail. Uh, but every single time we found a way to make it work and we, you know, we screw things in and we glue them in and we fudge it until something sticks, the parts show up, the people come out, and we try to put on a hell of a show while we're doing it. Um, I know that those sweating bullet, bullets moments are bound to happen and you just have to push through them and, and you lean on the ingenuity and determination of your team. And 
and honestly that struggle that like adrenaline rush of of the can we can we do it can we make it it makes it that much sweeter when you when you drive the final nail and the crowd cheers because now you you've been through something together um and that is the reason that that I keep coming back for more crazy um and why I hope that you'll find your way into it too so yeah I guess I I really powered through that very quickly um, that is, that's the whole presentation. So I don't know if anyone has questions. Uh, let me see if I can get back to the chat here. Um, yeah. So does anyone have questions about community build projects? I don't know how this works with, with getting questions in the chat versus, versus getting questions via YouTube. Um, let me see if I can pop over there. Also, I have a little bit of an allergy thing going on, so I'm a little sniffly today. Um, all right, I'm gonna pop over and see if I can if I can find the. Okay, no questions on YouTube. Um, I just wanna stop, stop screen sharing. No, it's just me. Um, okay, question for Jen. What is my next community build project? Uh, that's a tricky one. So we had another one planned for this year with the Smithsonian and we were gonna do another live community thing um, but because of what's going on in the world, it's not really safe to have a lot of people in one space. So that that project got put on hold. Um, there isn't anything specific scheduled for right now, but I am hoping that we can find ways to do more digital collaboration. Since since having a lot of people in one space is not not a thing that, that we can do right now, um, I think there is so much opportunity for uh, for people to work together online. There's a really great website called hitrecord.org. Uh, it was started, I think it was started by Joseph Gordon-Levitt, and it basically takes a one like little nugget of media and uh, people from around the world will collaborate and continue to pile onto it. So it's kind of like an exquisite corpse that happens digitally. Um, so someone will make like an animation and then a composer from another country will will compose a score and somebody else will do, um, you know, digital graphics over top of it. So there's a really cool existing platform for people to collaborate digitally. Uh, that's a long way of saying I don't specifically have another build coming up, but I'm, I'm interested in exploring the possibilities for remote collaboration. Um, all right, another question. I always hear about cool projects after they happen. Um, where can you look to get involved? Uh, for, I don't know for, for, for our project specifically, um, sometimes, you know, we'll, we'll promote them on social and stuff. Honestly, like events, like tap, tap into your local maker spaces, um, to take a look at local, um, sort of like maker publications, if there's newsletters and things like that. Uh, it's, it's mostly just about like being immersed in the community and, and you'll get, you know, you'll get people to reach out. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to think for, um. For our projects, I mean, I, I usually try to promote stuff on, on social in advance, people know where to find it, but yeah, there's lots of lots of resources for, for ways to get involved. Um, I don't know if there's any other, any other questions here. Um, yeah. Let me see if I can find the YouTube. Um, oh, that's weird. <laughs> Any other questions here? I can, um, I can see myself. All right. Yeah, I don't. I don't see any other questions. I'm not sure what else to. Uh, what else to cover at this point? I see see a bunch of people I know are on the on the chat. Thanks for coming, everyone. Um, also, oh, I should totally shout this out because uh, because Dan is here and because this is an awesome resource. Um, there is a, a maker event playbook, uh, which is a collaboration with Nation of Makers and some of the folks that run different maker fairs, including Dan Schneiderman, who's who's moderating. Um, 
It's on uh, makereventplaybook.org, I believe. And it's, I have just started to dig into it, but it's a huge repository of resources for people that want to lead or participate in community build projects. So if you're interested in doing your own build, you can head over there and check that out. It's, it's a really awesome resource and really great people behind putting that together. So definitely check that out. Any thoughts on what a digital community build would look like? Of course. <laughs> um, digital community build. Uh, I mean, some of the ones that we've that we've done have been sort of digital, like We the Builders was was very much a, you know, people are getting the SCL files and that a lot of the people that are contributing are not actually physically present. We're getting parts from all over the world, uh, but then we are building a physical thing. So digitally, I think one thing that, that comes to mind for me with digital is layering. So there's like it's it's one thing if everyone's like sort of making a tile of a thing, but I really like the concept of hit record where someone is making one thing using one medium and then people are building on top of that with other mediums. So it's first one is maybe visual, the next one is music, the next one is something else, dance or whatever. Um, and I think, you know, the, the options for documentation, like for recording quality video and audio and um, sharing things digitally and uh, even just like you know, sharing things over, over drive, there's lots of opportunities for like live collaboration to happen. So it's, it's not like you have to put a thing in the mail and send it and wait for somebody else to get back to it. Like everybody can kind of be in the thing all at once. Um, let's see. Yeah. Yeah. Have you considered a community build in virtual reality? Um, yeah. I mean, I, it, ah, virtual reality. That's interesting. I have not, I haven't got bit by the VR bug yet. I, I've only ever tried being in VR once. Um, I mean, it, it's a great idea. Uh, I think it would be neat to do something. I don't know. I don't know what the apps are to, to get into that, but it'd be neat for someone to use one of those like drawing or sculpting apps and build an environment that other people can then interact with and continue to build on. I think that would be really neat. Um, and maybe there's an opportunity to also layer in like animation and music. Um, yeah, uh, another question coming through. How did you, how did you get started making? Uh, it's hard, it's hard to pinpoint that. I have been making stuff. I think I was like, I came out that way. I was, I was born that way. Um, I was, I started making stuff for like my toys. I just like, if I wanted them to have, I don't know, a sleeping bag or clothes or furniture, I just made stuff for, for my like Beanie Babies or my brother's GI Joes. And I was always just like building, building things that would change the environment that would, that would, um, my, I mean, like my environment, things that I wanted to see that I wanted to create, I would just start making them. Uh, and then I, I started um, painting when I was like 10, I think. And that got me into art school. So I went down like the art school path and I studied fine art and sculpture and all that kind of like historical higher education level of art. And then after school, um, kind of went back a little bit and, and thought like, oh, I want to have this piece of furniture for my apartment. Um, and I, I don't, it's like super custom. So I would, um, I started acquiring power tools and like teaching myself. Uh, I found a local tool, tool library, uh, which teaches classes um, on how to use different saws. Uh, I got involved at a local maker space and got into laser cutting. So it was a long process and kind of figuring out that my people, my like community was the maker community and, and less so the fine art community. Um, but yeah, I, I think getting into maker spaces and, and tool libraries and things like that was, was sort of what cemented my identity as a maker. Um, let's see. I'm interested in the virtual reality build concept. I, I like I said, I, I don't have a VR headset, but I, I wonder if there's any people out there that are already doing that, that are like building stuff remotely in virtual reality. Um, yeah, I don't know. We still have 10 minutes. I don't know. I don't know what to, I don't have like a song and dance to fill the rest of the time. Do you ever keep parts of community projects after the builds? Um, I don't personally keep 
the the parts because in my mind it's like it's a thing that belongs to the community it's it's a very it's a public art project so usually the the pieces get displayed wherever they're going to live afterwards so like rosie's in a museum um the egress hatch is in a museum the SXS, SXSL letters, uh, I believe they're in a storage unit, but they're supposed to go to the Obama um, like foundation library afterwards, like as part of the, you know, part of the display there. Um, so no, I don't keep the, I don't keep the builds. Uh, I do, I'll keep memorabilia. So I have like somebody sent multiples of a rosy piece. So I kept one of the pieces. I keep letters that people send, obviously, I'll, you know, all the photos and documentation. Uh, I, I have a lot of sort of scrapbook type stuff that I save to remember it for myself. But yeah, when when that many people work on something together, in my mind, it's no longer mine. It becomes something that belongs to to the community. Make Do I ever make mini versions to sell as swag as a fundraising option for your next build? Um, that is a great idea. Uh, we have considered that with the We The Builders. I don't know if I can... I can try to show you something. Let me see if I can, I have my display cabinet here. Let me see if I can grab it. Okay, so <laughs> that, was, that was tricky. Um, this is a mini, a mini version of one of the We the Builder sculptures we made, very small version. Uh, and it's all attached by magnets. So like these pieces all come off. Ooh. All the sections have little magnets inside. So we have considered making these as like little puzzles um, that people could could buy and, you know, and using the proceeds to fund the builds. Um, so we love that idea. It just never, kind of never, got around to making it a thing, but I think that's fantastic. I think that'd be a great idea to make mini. I also made a miniature SXSL. Um, so yeah, well, I love that idea. Um, have you worked on any other fun projects in the past year? Uh, yeah, yeah, I got to do a lot of fun projects. Uh, let's see. In the last year, this time last year, I think around this time last year, we were getting ready for, uh, I can't remember if it was New York or San Diego Comic-Con. For Comic-Con, um, Adam was making a, uh, a no-face costume. He was making this huge, like sort of animatronic mouth with a, with a you know, draped fabric body. And he engineered and he engineered the whole thing, but he needed um, myself and, and my other colleague to make a bunch of foam for, for no face to eat a bunch of foam food. So I got to carve all of these um, fake pieces of food out of, out of upholstery foam. So I made like a huge hock of ham and some fish and some cake. Uh, I made, let's see, I actually just got a chance to make another, this is a obviously fake foam piece of cake uh, for another project that I'm working on. Uh, yeah, so I get to do a lot of stuff to support Adam's builds. And then in terms of my own stuff, mostly just studio shop organization. This is, this is my, uh, my home studio and it's, it's in a kind of weird situation because my, my living area is, is just outside of it. Um, so I'm trying to figure out ways to kind of like contain the mess and also make it a functional workspace. So I've been doing a lot of just shop organization stuff, building um, like carts and shelves and stuff like that. Skeleton on the shelf behind you. Is there a story? It looks very Halloween ready. Uh, yeah, that's uh, the, the cat skeleton. That's something uh, was in a storage unit that that Adam was getting rid of, and I pulled it out of the trash. And uh, it was it was like a plastic Halloween, like a white, you know, fake white looking skeleton. But I painted it black, and I rubbed I rubbed graphite powder on it. You can't really see it, but it's um, yeah. I, I just thought it looked cool and kind of like science science lab e to put up there. So that's what that's from. 
a lot of times I pick through the trash. If, if Adam is getting rid of something, I'm like, Ooh, that's really great fabric. Why would he, you know, it's like scraps to him, but to me, I'm like, Oh, I can save this for some, I'm, I'm a bit of a hoarder. That's the other problem. Um, all right, four minutes left. I'm so curious what other people are building if people have Halloween builds that they're working on. Um, oh, any tips on how to display projects? Uh, I really love the display case thing. Like, I don't know if you guys can see that. I've got very inspired by what's over at, at the cave. It's just like a, a glass case and I haven't yet, but I'm gonna put some lights inside of there. Um, so I keep all my little, my project memorabilia in there. Um, in terms of displaying the community builds, that's been a challenge. So especially if you're building something that's big, that's gonna take up a lot of space, it's a really good idea to have that figured out where it's gonna live beforehand. Cause there's nothing worse than getting done with a build and being like, whew, we did it, we're done. Okay, who's taking this thing home and where is it gonna go? So I, I, I think getting in touch with either the event or a local um, museum or something is a great way to to see if they want to display the work, even if, even if temporarily, or to see if there's a way to part it out and, and let people take it home. Um, yeah. Uh, any other any other last minute questions? Thanks. I'm just looking at, at YouTube comments. Um, yeah. Well, thanks everyone for for joining today. Um, yeah, this was this was fun. It's so it's so strange presenting to invisible an invisible audience. Uh, but I hope I hope this was fun and and educational for you. Um, I did put together a a worksheet um, with some links to like the uh, Smithsonian repository and other other things that might be useful to you. Um, I'll see if there's a way we can get that shared out to you afterwards. Um, but yeah. Awesome. Um, All right. Oh yeah, I see lots of people that I that I know here. Thanks everybody for coming.